Spotlight is a production of CTNY, the Catholic Television Network of Youngstown. It seeks to spotlight people, places, and events from around the Diocese of Youngstown that promote the new gospel of joy called for by Pope Francis. Your program host is Father James Corda. Hello and welcome to this edition of Spotlight. I'm Father Jim Corda. Joining me today is Monsignor Anthony Spinoza, and we're going to talk about the Basilica and National Shrine of Our Lady of Lebanon. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you. I, I think uh, to give the folks that are with us a nice flavor of the shrine, many of them are very familiar with it, but let's start with a little history of the shrine itself. Well, back in the early 1960s, uh, Father Peter Ede, who was the pastor of St. Mary's in Youngstown, uh, happened to be driving the back roads of North Jackson, uh, and no one knows why he was down there anyway, uh, happened to come across a sign that said, land for sale. Mm -hmm. And he thought, well, this might be a good place to put a shrine, a replica of the original shrine of Our Lady of Lebanon, which is in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. So um, he went up to the door of the farmhouse and told the lady that he might be interested in what he wanted to do with this property. And uh, evidently, the woman who owned the property didn't like Catholics, made it very clear and slammed the door in his face. And uh, Father Peter was kind of a tough person. So he persisted and he kept going back and saying, look, you know, this would be a nice place to have, you know, a, a shrine, a holy place, a church, uh, rather than a factory or a junkyard, as he put it. And uh, the woman just persisted. She said she would never, ever sell to Catholics, especially a priest. And he kept telling her about the Blessed Virgin and what he wanted to do. So she just wouldn't give in. So he, she, he called his brother, who was the pastor of Our Lady of the Cedars in Akron. And they called their cousin, who was the pastor of St. John the Baptist in Newcastle, and said, let's make a novena, see what happens. If nothing is answered, then God doesn't want it. So just before the nine days were over, Father Peter got a call from the lady, from the owner. And she said, uh, priest, come get your property. Uh, this lady that you speak of will not let me uh, sleep at night. So he ran over with the check in hand to give her a deposit and that's how it began. And they started plans uh, for it with the three parishes collaborating. And uh, ground was broken August 15th, 1964 and then the dedication was August 15th, 1965. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we still did not have our own diocese. Mm -hmm. So it was actually Bishop Malone who did the dedication. And I believe he had just arrived. I don't think he had been here very long. Correct. And, um, and there's a, a photograph of him at the very top mm -hmm. uh, doing the blessing with no railing around <laughs> the tower. So they persuaded this new bishop to go to the top with no safety railing. So, uh, yeah. well, I'm sure that uh, he was praying to Our Lady of Lebanon at the time uh, for his own safety. That he wouldn't safety, go plunging off sure. the tower. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, we know your, your rich history uh, since the founding of that, and um, it's been a, uh, a, not only a rich history, but a varied history. And uh, as we had spoken of prior to the taping, when people come to the shrine, they come primarily to pray. And that is why... I'm sure initially you have the space for people to gather, to celebrate. You have various different events throughout the year for people to gather spiritually, prayerfully. Uh, what I'd like to do before we get into some of those specifics is to talk a little bit about the Maronite Rite. Um, some people might not be familiar with that. So if you could share with us a little bit about the Rite. Uh, obviously, it's part of the, the Catholic Church but uh, some of its uh, difference with uh, leadership and maybe the language, the liturgy, if you could talk about that sure. briefly. Originally, it really came from the area of Antioch and Edessa. And uh, there was no real intention to establish a Maronite rite. Uh, it was kind of by accident. 
they were using the liturgy of St. James, which was very Semitic and yet very monastic, kind of a primitive type liturgy, similar to what the Chaldean Catholics use today and also the Syrian Catholics. And uh, as time went on, uh, the liturgy developed a little bit more, but still retained its Semitic monastic flavor. And uh, once the Muslim persecution began, uh, those Maronites from Antioch, Edessa, that area, really uh, took refuge in the mountains of Lebanon because they were inaccessible. And they remained there literally for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. uh, and Rome kind of lost a little communication with them. Uh, they knew that there were these people in the mountains of Lebanon, but obviously in those days there wasn't a whole lot of communication. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the time of the Crusades mm -hmm. when suddenly the Crusaders arrived and said, well, who are you people? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we're Maronites. Oh, who are Maronites? Well, we're Catholics. And so they were almost rediscovered in that sense. But throughout those centuries, they managed to preserve that liturgy and that heritage, again, very monastic, very Semitic, mm -hmm. using Aramaic as their primary language, which was also vernacular at that time. Is it my understanding that uh, the consecration during uh, the liturgy in the Maronite Rite still uses the Aramaic? We use Aramaic. We use it for the Trisagion, Holy God, Holy Strong One. Uh, we also use it for the consecration uh, for the epiclesis, and there are a few other places where we can use it. Uh, we've adapted to English, obviously, here in the United States, and if you go to our parish in Miami, you might hear it in Spanish uh, or something like that, because there were a number of Maronites who came from Cuba. Uh, and uh, so it, it, it takes on the, the vernacular of the country, but still retains that Aramaic. We've got about two minutes left in our first segment together. Uh, tell us a little bit, if you can, about the state of Lebanon. Um, you know, oftentimes when we hear about uh, the country, we, we think of it initially, uh, and they have mentioned it's like the Paris of uh, the East. But what about spiritually and what about militarily? Is anything going on that's at odds with one another? Well, politically, they have difficulties, mm -hmm. uh, and um, it's still considered a Christian country, the only Christian country in the Middle East, although the Christians are a minority, but the Constitution guarantees that the president is a Maronite. Mm -hmm. So that sort of helps. Mm -hmm. And also the patriarch who resides there has a great deal of influence, mm -hmm. socially uh, as well as spiritually and, and politically. So it really is kind of the anchor uh, of Christianity, but that could change very quickly because of the way things are now. It's very unstable. Well, we're gonna talk a little bit more primarily about uh, the new Basilica and the National Shrine in just a moment, but we're gonna take a quick break. Uh, stay with us, we'll be right back. Whether it's passing on medicine, a blanket, or something as simple as a glass of water, that's how compassion works. And that's how Mary Knoll works, hand to hand to hand. For nearly a hundred years, Mary Knoll's been passing on your help to the priests and brothers working in 26 countries around the world. Mary Knoll, an American Catholic organization, dedicates 86 cents of every dollar donated to their programs, serving the world's poor and powerless. And that's how it works. Compassion flows from your hand to the hand of someone in need. Hand to hand to hand. That's Mary Knoll. 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 Doesn't your child deserve the best education possible? Then you should consider a Catholic school where strong academics are offered in a safe, disciplined environment, where education is deeply rooted in the religious teachings of our Catholic faith, where graduation rates are exceptional, where outstanding teachers help your child reach his or her fullest potential in the classroom and in life. But you should consider a Catholic school for the most important reason of all. Your child is worth it. 
Welcome back to our show. I'm talking with Monsignor Anthony Spinoza of the Shrine of Our Lady of Lebanon. Uh, we know that the shrine recently became a basilica. Uh, tell us briefly about how that came about. I had asked our previous bishop, who's now retired, if that would be a possibility, because the original shrine in Lebanon was made a basilica. And I thought, well, it would be kind of nice to have one here. So we did petition Rome, uh, and this was over two years ago. And we never really heard anything. Mm -hmm. And um, no one knew what happened. And since our bishop retired, we got a new bishop. Uh, I asked the new bishop if he knew anything about it. And he had no knowledge. So as I had told you previously, that somewhere along the line, the documentation got lost. Mm -hmm. So he asked if we could resubmit it, which we did, and very quickly, within a matter of weeks, uh, we got word that Rome had made the Shrine a Basilica. So it's only the second Maronite Basilica in the world, and we're glad it's here in Mahoning County. <laughs> well, we're glad you're here as well. We, we know that there's a lot of wonderful things that happen at the Shrine, uh, from pilgrimages, from different groups gathering to celebrate uh, whatever is going on in their particular uh, uh, congregation, organization. Tell us about some of the different events that take place. Uh, we know that uh, coming up soon is your annual uh, Assumption Day gathering. Tell us about some of those special events and begin with where exactly the shrine is for people who might have never been there before that might be interested in visiting. It's on Lipke Road as you're heading out of Austin town you just go down Mahoning Avenue, heading west, um, just past the Meander Reservoir, that's the key. You go over the bridge and you're there. Uh, there's a sign that says National Shrine. Take a right on Lipke Road and it's two miles down the road. And so what are some events that people come and celebrate and pray about at the shrine? Our major celebration is obviously the Assumption Pilgrimage. Uh, and it's three days and uh, we celebrate the Latin liturgy as well as the Byzantine and the Maronites. Uh, we also have an anointing and a healing uh, liturgy in the middle of it and conferences. Uh, but we also have a St. Joseph Novena every year. St. Teresa is very popular. A Triduum to St. Jude, Christmas Novena, and whatever else. We try to bring in some speakers every once in a while and to, uh, you know, to accommodate different groups. You also have a wonderful uh, bookstore and gift store there. Tell us about that as well, because, you know, I think for many Catholics, it's important to be able to go and purchase things in a Catholic store. Uh, you know, I remember someone saying to me once uh, at Christmas time how nice it would be if, if Catholics gave gifts to their family and friends that are Catholic gifts instead of, you know, gifts from like. Uh, department store mm -hmm. and to have these these jewels like at the shrine where they can actually go and do that I think is a wonderful experience so what are some of the things that are in the book sh the, the the gift shop that people might find there books play a big part in the gift shop mm -hmm. uh, we actually have people that come up from the Steubenville area to search through our books uh, we try to be as diverse as we can with them, and um, people just want to read. They really do. They like spiritual reading. Some of it is light reading. Some of them get into the, the more detailed theological uh, aspect of it. Uh, we have gifts for First Communion and Confirmation and weddings, and we try to keep it as reasonable as we can. And uh, it seems that on Mother's Day, Children like to buy their mothers very nice rosaries, you know. Mm -hmm. So there's always a procession of people coming in to buy rosaries for their for their mothers. So it's 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 a nice gift shop. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to have something for everyone, even for the children. And I would imagine that you celebrate mass there on the weekends as well. Are there any other devotions that you do, in particularly on weekends, for people who can come from anywhere? We have a, a holy hour on uh, Sunday afternoon from 3.30 to about quarter to five. And uh, we do have people that come for that, Adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. We also have it on First Friday. 
Um, and because we're a little bit out of the way, it's difficult to have adoration you know, more frequently. But uh, we do have liturgy every day, uh, with the exception of Thursday, and then a weekend schedule. Uh, and it, we get people who come regularly and also visitors who just mm -hmm. pop in whenever they're in the area. Let's say that uh, there's a group that might be interested in, in coming from a particular parish or, or even out of state. What would be the process that they would uh, engage in to come to the shrine? All they have to do is give us a call or contact us on the website. And um, we have people who just do nothing but take care of the groups that come in. Uh, sometimes if they want to stay overnight, there are, there's lodging in the area and uh, we certainly can feed them. That's never been a problem at the shrine. <laughs> well, you know, there, that's something about the shrine that I'd like to say um, before we end the second segment, is that uh, when you go to the shrine, you're not only fed spiritually, but you're fed uh, bodily and physically as well. It, you know, I hearken back to the gospel. You know, Jesus did that in the feeding of the 5,000, recorded in all four gospels. And so he was there not only to feed their souls, but to feed their bodies. And, and how important is that in the life of, of Catholics to do that? People like to socialize. Mm. You really cannot have a good spiritual life unless you're socializing. Spirituality is not something to hoard with yourself. It's to share. And when people are sitting and eating and having coffee and that sort of thing, they share a great deal of their own personal lives and their, their spiritual experiences. And I have found that I learn so much from them. They expect me to teach them, but they don't realize that they're teaching me at sure. the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a great way of doing ministry. And I would think that uh, the shrine itself, in, in closing uh, briefly before we take a break, you need people to also volunteer their time. If it, people are interested in doing that, would they call you? Just give a call. We okay. always need volunteers. Okay. Our volunteers are an important part of the shrine, as they are in any parish, really. Yeah. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the shrine and the basilica in just a moment. Sure. We're going to take another quick break. Uh, stay with us. We'll be right back. I spent 34 years as a teacher. I just loved interacting with the students. Many sisters, brothers, and religious order priests served for little pay, and now their communities lack retirement funds. My very first class had 56 first graders. Gifts to the Retirement Fund for Religious help provide for medications, nursing care, and more. Please give to those who have given a lifetime. Donate at your local parish. God bless you for your help. Light Moments. Here's Father Tom McSweeney. Baseball is one of America's favorite pastimes. Spending a day at the ballpark, eating hot dogs, and singing Take Me Out to the Ball Game during the seventh inning stretch never goes out of style. But did you ever wonder how the seventh inning stretch got started? Back in the 1880s, brother Jasper Brennan was the baseball coach at Manhattan College. He was also the Dean of Discipline. When students attended baseball games, they were careful to sit quietly so that Brother Jasper wouldn't take them to task. During one game, Brother Jasper noticed that his students were especially fidgety, so he told them to stand up and move around. The popularity of the seventh inning stretch spread and soon became a national standard. Maybe an idea of yours will do the same someday. Remember, in order to hit a home run, you have to keep on slugging. This message from the Christophers, New York, New York, 10017. Welcome back. We're talking with Monsignor Anthony Spinoza of the Basilica and National Shrine of Our Lady of Lebanon. Uh, we would be remiss, and I'm glad you reminded me, about uh, the wonderful religious community that's present there at the shrine, and that is the Antonine Sisters. Um, we've had them here at CTNY on many occasions. Uh, they've been part of our vocation series. Uh, we're trying to help promote their new facilities there. Tell us about the Antonines, um, a little bit about their charism, and what exactly is going on in their life and community near the shrine. Originally, the Antonine Sisters were contemplative. 
until 1950, and then they began an active apostolate. They came to the United States to Cleveland, to our parish uh, in Cleveland in the late 1950s, and then came to the Youngstown area, I believe probably around 1961 or so. And uh, at that time, the old farmhouse was available by the shrine, so they took up residence there. And uh, a number of years later, our bishop gave them 10 acres of land plus the house because they wanted to remain here. And little by little, they developed their adult daycare, and now they just completed their assisted living and memory care facility. So they're independent from us, but we're next to each other. Uh, so we don't consider ourselves separate at all. It's, sure. it's one family there. And they do wonderful work with the elderly. And, you know, and that's part of their, their charism is, uh, is not only ministering to the elderly uh, spiritually, but, but in particular physically as well, because many of the sisters, if not all of them, are registered nurses. And so there's that, that wonderful uh, ministry that they provide as consecrated religious uh, to our elderly. And then, of course, as you mentioned, the new facility that uh, they just completed. Uh, what, what is so uh, crucial uh, about religious life that, uh, that we want to uh, lift up here? Not only consecrated religious life and, uh, as sisters, but also as brothers and priests. Why is that important in the life of our church today? People take example from the way we live. Uh, and if people get a sense that the priests or the religious are not happy, they are not going to be happy. And it doesn't foster vocations. Uh, vocations really come from happy clergy and religious. And the nice thing with the sisters, they're always in a good mood. Uh, and people notice that. And uh, even with a lot of our priests, uh, we do receive vocations from the parishes uh, because I would say for the most part our priests are rather happy and it affects the lives of the people, especially the young people who might be discerning a vocation. I'd like to talk about that uh, a little bit further in, uh, in Lebanon, for example. Uh, what would vocations be like in the country there? We know here in the United States we're experiencing the fewer priests and fewer religious coming forward and responding to the call. What's happening in Lebanon? Well, they still seem to have a good number of vocations. Uh, I believe it's kind of slowed down a little bit, uh, but they still have the vocations there, but obviously they need them to minister to their own people. So it's not always easy to ask them to come to other countries, uh, especially when the need in their own country is great. But here in the United States, we have to take fostering native vocations very seriously. Uh, the history of the church, whenever it's been a missionary church, mm -hmm. knows that when you go to another country, your time as a foreign missionary is very limited. Right. And then you have to have your own vocations from that country. Uh, it can't go on indefinitely with just the missionaries. So right now they're, they're doing rather well with vocations, but you never know when that could change. Sure. Now would, uh, this might be a rather uh, ignorant question on my part, but uh, would you have Maronite churches uh, on all continents of the globe? Just about, they're all over the place now. Uh, the, our bishops just came back from Lebanon. They had a, a synod because they were electing a bishop for Venezuela. Mm. Uh, we have a diocese um, in Mexico City. There's one in Brazil. I believe there's one in um, Argentina, mm -hmm. Australia, Canada. Uh, now they have uh, parishes in South Africa. There are even Maronites in Sweden. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they ever got to Sweden, mm -hmm. but they're all over the place now. Uh, it's not just a Middle Eastern uh, phenomenon. They're, they're, they're universal at this point. Well, what's, what's beautiful about the faith is that it kind of goes where we go. And, um, and so if, if Maronite Catholics go to Sweden, obviously a congregation will burgeon there. And so, so that's, that's really the beauty of the faith, that it continues to grow and expand. Um, in, we've got about three minutes left of our uh, final segment. What do you find most, most gratifying 
in your position at the shrine as the rector there of the basilica, what do you enjoy doing on a daily basis? I just like to visit with people a lot. Uh, they will come in, they will just talk. Um, sometimes they come in with difficulties. Uh, it's important just to be around the shrine mm -hmm. when people kind of come and go. Uh, unlike a parish where you have people making appointments, uh, it doesn't really happen that way at the shrine. Uh, it just happens spontaneously. And especially on weekends or on a Sunday when the weather is good, I try not to leave the property because people are just coming all the time and you don't know who they are and uh, you don't know what their situation is. And in a moment of grace, you might be able to help them. And that's what's important. What would be some of the challenges that lie ahead for uh, the Basilica, for the Shrine, and maybe for you and the congregation of the Antonines that are there in North Jackson? Well, since the Shrine is not a parish church, it's always a financial challenge. Um, we don't have the kind of like the infrastructure of an X number of parishioners and parish councils and finance committees. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. But God is good. I mean, he takes care of us and you know, we don't have a lot of money to spend, but just when things get a little difficult, something works out well. But um, it, it's just a, a different type of ministry. In a sense, it's less structured. And that's what's really very, very nice about it. Uh, there's a latitude that you have that uh, sometimes parishes cannot do because they have to maintain uh, a certain program and schedule. Could you give us the phone number again and the website if folks would like to contact the Shrine? The phone number is 330-538-3351 and the website is OurLadyOfLebanonShrine.com. Well, Monsignor Anthony Spinoza, it was a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you. We thank you for the great work you're doing out at the Basilica and the National Shrine. It's been part of our uh, local diocese for 50 years. Uh, we certainly rejoice and celebrate that anniversary with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. Have a good day, and God be with you. Spotlight has been a production of CTNY, the Catholic Television Network of Youngstown. Your program host was Father James Corda. Thirty-three million Americans have descended into poverty, and as their futures fall, so does our nation's. Johnsons enjoy Friday dinners out, nothing fancy, just time together to reconnect as family. They make sure others eat as well. By giving to Catholic Charities of Youngstown, the Johnsons join other angels who care for those in need, regardless of religion or race. Show your wings with a gift to Catholic Charities, changing lives one family at a time, providing housing, emergency financial assistance, senior services, and more. Give now at ccdoy.org.